Good morning, body of Christ. Happy Thursday, <clears throat> excuse me, Ju July 22nd, 2021. Good morning, God bless you. This is Pastor Ronnie from Safe by Grace Ministries in San Francisco. Coming to you to break down the chapter of Colossians chapter 3. This is a very powerful chapter in this book. I was um, in a Bible study with my pastor last night, and he was focusing his Bible study on three scriptures from this chapter. And I've been telling my congregation that God has allowed me to be over to study this chapter. And because I haven't been able to get back to it because of all the other revelations and sermons that God has been having me teach, I'm going to take this time to break this down and make sure that they get it, but also make sure that you get it. So, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, I first and foremost want to thank him, Father, and thank you, Father, through the power of the Holy Spirit that has kept me alive, Father God, for these 54 years. I thank you for the impartation of the Holy Spirit that you have allowed me to take part in, to be used by, that you have decided to walk in this body. I humbly give you all the praise, honor, and glory for everything that has taken place in my life, both good and bad, happy and sad, Father. I know it is because of you, Father, that I am equipped with the mindset to do my job, Lord. I know it is because of you that equips me with the spirit to be able to preach and teach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I know it is because of you that I even have breath in my lungs, vision in my eyes, and that I am alive today, Lord. I just want to thank you first and foremost before we even get into this word just for those things, Lord. I ask you to use me, Father God, to impart into your sons and your daughters this word from Colossians chapter 3 to open up their minds, Father God, to know and understand the word of God in Jesus' name. Amen. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. When we get to verse 5, I'm going to really break down verse 5 because verse 5 coincides with Galatians 5.19 that talks about what we're going to read about. So Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. If you read Matthew 6, 33, it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, and all these things you have need of shall be added to you. It says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Jesus said the kingdom of God is in us, but he also said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness. His righteousness is the righteousness of Jesus Christ that now resides in us. When the Bible says he that is in us is stronger than he that's in the world, he's referring to the Holy Spirit. So he's saying here, if you've been risen with Christ, means you died in baptism, you've died to your old nature, you've died to your old way of thinking, then your mindset should be on the things of heaven and not on the earth. Verse 2. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. We just spoke about that. For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Meaning that you have died to your flesh. You have died to the ways of the world and you have become alive in Jesus Christ. Now you are hidden in God. We are children of the most high God and our life no longer belongs to us. It belongs to Jesus who now will live his life through us while we are walking with him. Verse three, for you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Verse four, when Christ who is our life shall appear 
then shall you also appear with him in glory. Now, I read this scripture last night, and it coincides strongly and actually is a scripture, 1 John 3, 2, that's in Sunday's sermon that we're going to be preaching about heaven and hell. But when Christ is risen, we will rise with him. We will have a like body like his. We will be like-minded because we are in him. Christ in us, the hope of glory. When he rises, we will rise. We will have that new created body according to Thessalonians, according to Matthew, according to 2 Corinthians 11. It talks about this glorious body we're going to be. So we're now being dead to who we are and we're learning to live out our godly life in this new body we are. We're not supposed to be so focused on the things that we used to be focused on that were going on in the world, but we're to be focused on the things that God is telling us to do that coincides with heaven. The Bible says, um, let thy will be done on earth as it already is in heaven, meaning that whatever God's will for us in heaven is the same will that he has for us down here. So our, our job is, is to fulfill the will of God on earth that he's telling us to do. Remember, he's living his life through us. Verse 5. Verse 5. Pay close attention. I'm putting this up here so you guys can see it to write it down. Because when they was doing Bible study last night, this is what I came up with. And because this is a video, you can go back and pause it. We're going to focus on verse 5 because it talks about mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affections, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Now, when my pastor was doing cross-referencing these last night, the Spirit told me to look it up because there's a lot in verse 5 of Colossians 3 that a lot of people may not get. So to mortify your bodies means that you're mortifying this body. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, it says that our bodies are the temple of the living God and that we are to not live according to the dictates and the desires of this flesh that are contrary to the word of God. Fornication, unmarried sex, uncleanness, immoral sexual desires, inordinate affections, unhealthy sexual desires, evil concupiscences, unusual sexual longings that gratify yourself. And that also is a gratification to having something as a sexual object. And covetousness is used here as wanting another person's mate. That's what he's saying. Kill that. Kill those sexual, immoral, perverse desires that your flesh has because that is the sin against your body and your body is the temple of God, you men and women. And again, I have stated this way too many times. I have been guilty of everything that I'm telling you to stop doing. Colossians chapter three, verse five reads like this. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth unmarital sex, immoral sexual desires. Immoral means having a desire to do with someone else that is not in the will of God, not in the line of God, taking your perversity and doing things that are un immoral sexually with someone. Inordinate affections, unhealthy desires, 
You shouldn't be desiring someone that is not yours, something that is not yours, and letting these thoughts run through your head continually. The enemy will bombard your mind with sexual thoughts. You'll see this woman walking. You'll undress her with her body. You'll see things on her. You'll start fantasizing. You'll start imagining. These are immoral, um, unusual, sensual longings. You want this just to please yourself in that moment. Masturbation is one of the great things. Pornography is one of the great things. Watching rated R movies, um, looking at uh, playboys. And it's not just men that do these things. Women have these problems too. That's why they call them in the old days, heartaches. He's telling us to put these desires to death. That's why the Bible says, Marriage, the married bed is 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 not defiled because you're married one to another under the covenant of God. What you do with your husband or wife, male and female, not male and male, not female and female, male and female, what you do in that marriage covenant is not defiled because you're one. Remember, the Bible says when you are joined together with your spouse, you become one flesh. So I wanted to really focus on that. And I'm not going to leave out adultery because adultery is what they talk about in Galatians 6, 19, which is having sex with someone else's wife or husband. So these are things that the world is into right now. You look at all these young kids, um, transgender, bisexual, um, that all that, um, the gay marriages, the men with men, women with women, these are things that are immoral to the Lord. And people think us Christians are judging them. No, we are loving them, but trying to get them away from that sin that's holding them in bondage that they are practicing that's going to send them to hell. We're not judging because we have our own sins that we're dealing with, but we want to help you pull away from those sins and people always think we're judging. You have to understand something. To be a Christian, you're going to be criticized. You're going to be persecuted. You're going to be talked about because you're saying, I'm living the best way I can to this book. And because I serve the God of heaven and not the God of this world or the God of my flesh, which is myself, I have to share this with you. Verse 6, for which things sake... The wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. The wrath of God comes on the children of disobedience. If you are a Christian, a child of the Most High God, you're supposed to be walking in obedience, not disobedience. This is why I believe God leads me in the spirit to break these scriptures down in chapters when I do so people can get the full understanding of what the scripture is saying. Verse 7 in the which you also walk sometimes when you lived in them. See, he's talking like, hey, this used to be you, Pastor Ronnie. This used to be you, Sister So-and-so. This used to be you, Brother So-and-so. This used to be you, Bishop So-and-so. This used to be you, leader of the worship team. We all used to be these folks, and that's why God tells us to have compassion and, and to go back into the world as he leads so we can pull them out of that darkness. Verse 7 again, and the which you also walked sometimes when you lived in them. Verse 8, but now you also put off, put off, stop doing, stop doing all these things. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Some of you as Christians still cuss like it's the thing to do, like, oh, you are really being disobedient to God. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off, put off the old man or woman with his or her deeds. Verse 10, and have put on the new man or woman, which is renewed in knowledge, which is renewed in knowledge. That knowledge is the Bible. We have to understand we are to put off anger, wrath, malice, blasphemies, filthy communication. I'm not going to be talking out of my mouth, cussing. I'm not going to be belligerent. We have to not talk that way. He said, put that off because you're no longer that old person. You are this new person. Don't get caught up in sexual immoral desires. Go get married. Make sure that this man or woman is actually from God. You are a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17 
verse 10, and have put on the new man or woman, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. This means that I now have this knowledge of this Bible of the image of God that he wants me to walk like that image, think like that image, talk like that image because I'm being recreated to go back to that image. I preached on this on, on Bible study, um, Isaiah 43, 1, Jude, uh, 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 Jacob was created, but Israel was formed. Israel was formed out of the creation of what Jacob was. We was created. Now we're being formed to be placed back into the image of God. Verse 11, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all put on put on. So we put off, now we're putting on. We put off, now we're putting on. Therefore, as the elect of God, the chosen and sanctified, that is us. We are chosen and sanctified. We have taken off the old man, the old woman, the old nature, the old thoughts, the old desires, and we have put on Christ. We have put on this image. We have put on this new character. Put on Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering, suffering, forbearing one another and giving one another and forgiving one another. Forbearing means putting up with them because they're not where you're at. The Church of Saved by Grace Ministries, I got in a car accident on Monday. The church members that knew about it, they've all been so supportive. When I was, when I pulled my back, they was all supportive. They showed kindness. They showed mercy. They showed long suffering. They was there for me. Through a lot of the stuff, we, I, I have been an example of this kind of person to them in this character because I've done the same for them because God taught me how to be an example and in return they would be an example back to us so we are one body when one part of the body hurts the other part of the body hurts and I, I'm just coming out of this thing today and I said, you know what, Lord, I want to get back into the word. I want to share the word. You know, I want to thank the church. I want to be able to just give praise to my pastor for the, because him and I are running this in sequence with this study. And, you know, here I'm teaching about heaven and hell. He's teaching about sin, how not to walk in sin, what sin is, how sin can hurt you, how sin separates you from God. He's got this whole uh, series that he's doing. And I, I pop in every now and then on Bible study days, but God always shows me other things as he's sharing his Bible study, but God allows me to stay connected to the Bible study as well. So I'm double, like, like yesterday, I was in pain and I had all these patches and stuff on, but God started to do Bible, um, church Sundays, church service, and Bible study all at the same time through me. And I'm sitting there cracking up going, I don't know how you do this, and I don't even know how I can keep up with you because I got one part on the computer I'm doing for Sunday service when I'm writing stuff down on a tablet for Bible study. It's the power of God. It's the connection of God. It's the union of God that allows me to do that. I do not preach nothing that I'm not led to by God. He has to tell me what to preach. He has to tell me, and, and I truly believe everything that comes out in Bible study and Sunday service is not from me. I, I don't, I, I truly wait for him. Just like this, I was moved to do this this morning, so I'm doing it. Because we have to be led by the Spirit. We talked about that, led by the Spirit, talking the Spirit, praying the Spirit, thinking the Spirit, acting the Spirit, living the Spirit. Verse... 13, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man or woman has a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also you forgive them. A lot of people have lip served, oh, I forgive you. 
But behind your back, they're talking about what you did still. You can't forgive somebody and then yet still go talk about what they did. When you forgive, you forgive. It's under the blood, cast into the sea of forgetfulness like Christ does with us. He remembers our sin no more. We can't remember that because then we're holding it against them. Then we didn't really forgive them. And a lot of you need to forgive, but you still need to separate. I, I forgave you, but I'm not going to give you an opportunity to do that again. Because in my spirit, it's, I feel like I need to separate myself from you. Um, verse 14. And above all things, above all these things, put on love. Put on love. Put on love, which means it's not always on you. You got to put it on. Put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts to, to the which also you are called in one body and be ye thankful. Verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom teaching and admonishing, urging, urging one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. When you're praising and you're worshiping, you're doing that to God. You're not doing that to man. You're doing that to God. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. What I'm doing is to please the Lord, not to please man. I respect man. I respect authority, but I'm not doing this because of that. I'm doing this because of God. When I got in the car accident, of course, my flesh quickly said, what the heck? But when I looked at the light, I said, okay, I'm not in the wrong, but I still spent a couple of days asking myself and asking God, did I error? I know what I saw, but I need to make sure, Lord God, because if I'm at fault, I need to take full responsibility for what I did because it was a head-on collision. But even though the light showed that I was right, that man's light showed that his was yellow, so there was there was a conflict in the lights. Now, it may have not been either or, but still, because of my humility, because of my connection with the Holy Spirit, I had to evaluate and examine my part. See, a lot of people want to always blame everybody else. No, we need to take part in ourselves. Did I do this? Now, I don't believe that the enemy had a part in that, and I know a lot of people do because I could have died, but God had me covered either way, regardless if it was the enemy or not, God kept me alive, and thank God for that, and I was so caught up wondering on everything that happened that I actually didn't thank God for salvaging my life till the next day when I was sitting there going, Lord, I, man, I'm sorry, I forgot to thank you for saving me. I was so caught up on, did I do wrong? Did I do right? This was a, a company vehicle, all these things. But I quickly, for, I mean, it was, and I'm like, I'm sorry, Lord, because you kept me alive. I could have been in heaven on Monday. Verse 18, wives, submit, not girlfriends, not boyfriends. Wives, submit to your, yourselves unto your own husband as it is fit in the Lord. As you submit to your husband, your husband's supposed to be submitting to God. I tell all men and women, when you're in a relationship and you know that this is the person you want to marry, you know that this is the person that God has for you, you start to treat that man or that woman as if you're already married to them without the benefits of marriage. Don't get it twisted. I, when I'm in a relationship with a woman, well, it's been a long time, but when I am, if I believe that that woman is from God, and I, even I have to be careful because a lot of times I thought the woman that I was was the one, so we have to be real discerning. It doesn't mean the person is bad. It just means that that may not be the person God has for you. 
You have to make real close discernment, but you're to treat that person as if you're going to marry them without the benefits. Which means I'm not going to live with you because we're not married and I'm not giving no place to the devil to tempt me to sleep with you. But I'm going to wait till I'm married to you. But I'm going to honor you and respect you and treat you like you're my wife already. So it doesn't change when you become my wife. It enhances. That's what you have to understand. That's that work and that's where the counseling comes in. That's where the fellowship comes in. That's where the woman gets with other women that are married and hear the story so they can learn how to be around their husbands and the same thing with the husband. 19. Husbands, love your wives. Be not bitter towards them. Husbands have a responsibility. I tell this all the time to my son-in-law. You are the head covering for my daughter. It's no longer me that's that head covering. I've taken my prized possession, which is God's prized possession. I've placed her into your hands, trusting that you're going to protect her, that you're going to lead her to God, that you're going to be a good head covering to her, and that you will never make her feel less than she is. Because that was my job, and now that is his job. So every man, you got to understand your wife is right after God comes your wife and you're to treat her better than you treat yourself because she is your wife. She's bone of your bone and flesh of your flesh. And the Bible says for a wife to respect her husband. I may not agree with what my husband says, but I will respect him and have a conversation with him in private to tell him what I don't agree with, but I'm still going to honor him and respect him because God placed him above me. But you're equal in all things. You should be conversating about anything together that has to do with your life. Don't take a job just because the job is offering more money. Come to your wife and say, I've got this opportunity. Or come to your husband and say, hey, this has been dropped in my lap. But what do you think about it? Because we're partners. We're one. So what affects one affects the other. I could get on a marriage topic right now, but we're not. Children. You see it said husband, the wife, husband, now child. Verse 20. Children, obey, obey, obey your parents in all things. Not some things, in all things. For this is well-pleasing to the Lord. So we all have a part that we need to understand. I'm telling you, chapter 3 of Colossians was, is intended. It talks about your flesh. It talks about sin. It's talking about marriage. It's talking about family. It's talking about God. It's talking about unity. It's talking about who we are in God, how we should be seeking things above. All this in one chapter. You think that God only wants to show this to me? He wants to show it to you. That's why he wants you in the word. Oh, my God. Fathers. So we went from wives to husbands to children. Now to the father. Father, provoke not your children to anger. Lest they be discouraged. When I deal with my children to the best of my ability, I try not to discourage them or, or be, be provoked in the wrong. I explain why I'm telling them of what I'm asking them to do. I tell them about the sin that they're doing because I've lived through the punishment of the sin that I did that they may be doing. Then I do the same thing to the church because a pastor is basically a, a shepherd over the flock, which is basically a father over the church. I have a big responsibility that God has entrusted to me. And a lot of people don't understand that your pastors have a heavy burden to tend to the church, to tend to the flock, to deal with Bible study, to deal with um, Sunday service, to deal with the phone calls, to deal with the hospitals, to deal with the counseling, to deal with the marriages. And those of us pastors like myself that actually have jobs, then we have a job. And that's a whole other ministry in itself. So you have to understand, we, we have a big responsibility Oh, now we're talking about servants. Verse 22, servants, obey in all things your master according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness. 
and singleness of heart, fearing God. My boss, I st he's my boss. Regardless of he's younger than me or not, he is still my boss. I have to respect him because I work for him. Just like God, the CEO of Saved by Grace Ministries is God. I am the executive director, and some people can't seem to wrap their minds around that, but that's not my problem, because God is the one that's over saved by grace, then he tells me what to do, and it gets done. Verse 23, and whatsoever you do, do it heartedly as to the Lord and not unto men. You're supposed to be worrying about pleasing God first. Man is after, because when you please God, God says to make even your enemies at peace with you. Verse 24, knowing that of the Lord, you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. Last scripture, verse 25. But he that doeth wrong shall receive from for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. And Heavenly Father, we have taught by the grace of God, Colossians chapter 3, with such reverence and grace, such wisdom and understanding, Lord, that I pray your sons and your daughters really meditate on this word. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all.